hello. So, fortunately, my video is cut off, but that's all right. I'll, I'll add a, I'll throw in a death as a gang boss at the beginning for the lack of one on that. So this video is going to be one of my recent interests, last couple months. I've been interested in the, uh, the writers of the French Renaissance, which, uh, you know, like English Renaissance, same time period. And uh, it's going to be mostly about uh, Pierre de Ronsard and uh, Joachim du Bellay. So this is the edition of Ronsard I've been reading, the Penguin Selected Poems, which I was not aware of, but it's totally in French, except for a literal translation of the French at the bottom. And my French is certainly not good enough to read a French Renaissance poet, but luckily they have literal translations. And then uh, this is the edition here of uh, Du Bellay. The Regrets. It's a bilingual edition, so that's uh, really nice. But um, yeah, I'm going to start with uh, Ronsard, because, let me see, were they... Yeah, he was born a year earlier, actually, so I guess that's appropriate. But he was mostly known, oh, born in 1524, and Du Bellay was 1525, so they're about 30 years earlier than Shakespeare. And, uh, you know, Edmund Spencer, Philip Sidney, they were all about 30 to 40 years later. And, uh, yeah, Ron Sard was mostly known for his love poems. I think that's what he's most famous for. And I'm going to read uh, three of his poems here, just uh, at least parts, so that you can get an idea of what he wrote like. Um, yeah, I'll just, let's get into it. So, um, this is one that is from his uh, the second book of love, the the loves the, for the Moors for Marie. And this is one that was suppressed in 1578. That's how you know it's good. So. It is um, the sixth poem here in that book, second book. And I'm just going to read the literal translation, which, you know, is regrettable, but that's the way it is. So, I am sending you a posy, which I have just selected with my own hand from these blossoming flowers. If they had not been gathered this evening, they would have fallen on the ground tomorrow. Take this as a clear example that your beauties, although they are in full bloom, in a short time will wither away and fall, and, like flowers, will perish in an instant. Time passes, time passes, my lady, alas, not time, but we, we pass away, and soon we shall be stretched out beneath a tombstone. And when we are dead, no more will be heard of the love we are speaking of. Therefore, love me, while you are still beautiful." He was quite the, quite the sweet talker, real sad. And uh, let's see, what's this next one? Oh yeah, this one's a good one. This kind of relates to uh, my other video I made on the, um, the, the non-fiction about the anatomy of melancholy, overmuch study, melancholy from overmuch study. This one's called, uh, the title is, this is from his odes, he wrote odes too. Like, uh, like the tradition of Horace. And this one's called, My Mind is Thoroughly Exhausted. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's one thing I'll say real quick, but you'll get that later, that these guys were heavily influenced by the, uh, like, Latin classics especially. And their goal was to heighten the French language so much so that their poetry and the language would stand up to the classics in Latin and Greek. So they wanted to write poems that would, uh, you know, be reasonably compared with their uh, their classics that they loved so much. And uh, they pretty much did. 
So this one is called, My Mind is Thoroughly Exhausted. My mind is thoroughly exhausted from too much study of eritus phenomena. It is time I had some fun and went out into the fields to play. Good heavens, who would want to praise those who glued to a book never had any interest in living? What use to us is studying except to exhaust us and to pile care upon care onto us, who will perhaps become either this morning or this evening the victim of black Orcus, Orcus who is so pitiless that he does not pardon anyone. Corridon, go on ahead, find out where good wine is on sale, chill the bottle, look for a shady arbor where I can recline, don't buy me any meat, because, however tasty it may be, I hate meat in summer. Buy apricots, melons, artichokes, strawberries, and some cream. That's what I like in summer, when beside a stream I eat to the sound of the water, stretched out on the bank or in a lonely cave. Now, while I am hale and hearty, I want to laugh without stopping, for fear that one of these days illness may say to me, I have defeated you now. Die, my merry friend. You have lived too long. And, uh, yeah, so you see there he, he mentions Orcus, which is the uh, reference to Hades, the underworld, and then Corridon, which is the like a, like a character in uh, Virgil's Eclogues. So you can see there they reference a lot of classical bits. And the last one here is from uh, Epitaphs on Various Subjects, which is one of his later books. And apparently this one was suppressed in 1578 as well. It's the Epitaph on Francois Rabelais. And uh, <laughs> um, it's pretty funny. I'm just going to read a couple parts of it. If nature engenders something from a dead man who lies rotting, and if generation comes from corruption, a vine will be born from the stomach and belly of our worthy Rabelais, who drank constantly while he was alive. For with a single swig, his great gob would by itself have drunk more wine, draining it nose first into shakes, than a pig drinks sweet milk, or than iris drinks rivers, or than the tawny shore drinks waves. And then, uh, cutting through to the end. Now you who pass by, whoever you may be, hang drinking vessels over his grave, hang some sparkling wine there and some bottles, sausages and hams, for if beneath his tomb tombstone his soul still has some feeling, he prefer prefers these to lilies, however freshly they are picked. So, I thought that was neat, him talking about one of his contemporaries. So that's Pierre de Ronsard. And next is one of his friends. They were, they were friends and they wrote about each other in their poetry. I couldn't find anything about Du Bellay in this collection of Ronsard's poetry, but as you'll see here in the regrets, um, Du Bellay does talk about Ronsard. Kind of the background to this book here real quick is that uh, Du Bellay was obviously from France and he accompanied a cardinal to Rome and he considered that a big mistake and he writes this whole collection of regrets while he's in Rome in exile. My, uh, somewhat voluntary exile and uh, so these ones are translated into verse so they're a little little nicer to hear I used to fret beset by all my ills that fortune had dealt in a long series of bad hands I followed Apollo or tried to and had that holy passion the God sometimes instills that's over and done those fires have burnt low and I'm prompted now by those troubles that evoke a different set of responses the cruel joke is that they've taught me much of what I know. Which is why, Seigneur, having failed in my ascent to Ronsard's heights on Parnassus, I am content with these modest trails in the foothills that I keep to. I know my heart, my wind, my limitations, 
to follow his splendid example. It's a tempta temptation to excellence I resist, as I've learned to do. You see there how he mentions Ronsard as like uh, the success that Dubele is secondary to. And uh, that made me think of uh, Paperbird's recent video where he talked about that guy who wrote a book about a, a you know, the teenage dragon or whatever. It's, uh, it's good. And then this one's the 11th poem here. Apollo's art is not for the vulgar herd. It's hardly a way for the greedy to make big money. Ambitious men think of poetry as a funny waste of their time. In a soldier's pack, it's absurd to expect a book of verse. The big wigs shun it. The clever are clever enough to keep their distance. It's a sorry business. Take Dubelet, for instance, to demonstrate the scorn people heap upon it. Courtiers think it is profitless and dumb. Artisans want to be paid in advance, if they come. The muse is a bad mistress, a worse wife. I remain nonetheless faithful. I will not quit. It's only my writing that comforts me a bit. And I thank the muse for the last six years of my life. And then uh, I'll just read one more. This is number 29. I hate more than death itself, a stay-at-home, a kid who never goes out except to a fet, and keeps in his house afraid in a cold sweat, like a beast locked in a cage or in an inmate in some cell. But an old geezer who runs here and there with feet that skitter the way his mind does too, always on his way like a courtier, courier who has an urgent dispatch to deliver to someone somewhere, I also hate. And both of them are wrong. The one who can't go and the one who can't stop for long. The first is a coward, the other's a reckless crazy. Both of them both of them are wasting their lives, for they spend their time as if they never believed it could end. To know one's place in the world is not so easy. And uh, another thing I just remembered here is that he has a dedication to the reader, which uh, I'll read here. Reader, this little book we bring is flavored of honey and gall and more than a dash of salt. Should this delight your palate, lovely, come and dine. But should you find it's not your thing, then leave. The meal was not meant for the likes of you. It's quite all right. You go your way, and I'll go mine. And uh, that reminds me very much of the beginning of The Book of Disquiet by Pessoa. And uh, it's just so nice seeing those um, continuations of the tradition, you know. It's just so nice. And... Uh, yeah, kind of connecting off those two friends, artist friends. Um, I recently was fortunate enough to find a translation of Ovid's Poems of Exile, which is uh, this penguin one. I had been looking for it for a while, but for some reason it's so expensive for this, you know, simple penguin, you know, that cost 1095 whenever it was published in the early 90s, I think. But now you can't find it for less than like 30 or 40 dollars. It's so crazy. But, uh, yeah, just like, I'm sure you guys know, but like, uh, Ovid was during the time, kind of around Virgil, um, Augustan regime, and he messed up. So he was forcibly exiled to the Black Seaport of Thomas in uh, AD 8, apparently. And while he was there, he wrote uh, two sets of poems. One is called uh, Tristia, and the other one is the Black Sea Letters. And uh, both of those two guys I just mentioned reference Ovid multiple times and reference all the classics, and especially Du Bellay, you know, because these are... Du Bellay here is exiled, and he certainly is modeling some of it off Ovid's Poems of Exile. So I wanted to read a little bit of it, because uh, I really like these sort of poems where the uh, classics are talking about how they messed up or what makes them sad. It's 
just always uh, heartening to know people have felt this way forever. And uh, so here is the twelfth poem in the Tristia, Book 5. I'm just going to read a little bit of it so you can get the feeling of it, and then I'll be done. You write that I should divert these mournful days with writing, stop my wits rotting from neglect. That's hard advice, my friend. Poems emerge as the product of happiness, need peace of mind. But my fate shaken by adverse gales, there could be nothing more wretched than what I endure. Priam, you're saying, should have fun fresh from his son's funeral, or Niobe, bereaved, let off some cheerful dance? When I'm sent alone to this native outback, I ask you which of the two should occupy my mind, sorrow or composition? You can quote me the valiant spirit displayed by Socrates at his trial, yet wisdom will crumble under so massive a downfall, and a god's ire eclipse mere human strength. Yeah, so that's that's just a little bit so you can get an idea of it and I've been thinking about that quite a lot because it seems to me that I'm most productive or I read the most when I'm feeling really bad or something bad is happening. You know, if I'm in the hospital or um if I'm really stressed out by school, even if I have less energy, basically like right now. School just started back up, and I just got off work. I have the most energy to do stuff, and I don't know why that is, because it doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like it should be that way. It seems like when I'm in a good mood and I'm feeling all right, I should be able to just do whatever I want, but that's not the way it works. The way it works is that, you know, when I'm exiled or when I feel especially pessimistic or even, you know, misanthropic when I think about politics or school or the 1.4 whatever trillion student loan debt or any of this stuff. It's just like, it's like alien like stupidity, you know, just can't even, can't even believe it's real. You'd think I wouldn't want to do anything. You'd think I'd fall into apathy and just, you know, wither away. But, nope, that's when I end up reading too much and wasting all my time and, you know, you know, wasting. <laughs> the only valuable thing I ever do is read. Well, that's too much, but basically. So, yeah, I mean, uh, if anyone's read these writers, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. If you liked any of them, let me know. I can do more of this type of stuff where I talk about classics or, yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, death is a gang, boss.